Welcome everyone. This is Kim Kennard and I'm with ARC Benefit Solutions. We're here to talk about Compliance Club. Uh, this is our summer webinar series and um, I, what I'm going to do is as, as I go through, if you want to pop questions in, I'll try to remember to check that as I go through, but um, you can also, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end and um, feel free to, to um, to drop in as many as you like. I will, if, if can't answer them all in this time, then what I will do is make sure that I make time to contact you personally and we can answer your questions with your client advisor. So with that, I'm gonna slide, hit the next slide. Oh, I pushed the wrong button. That happens sometimes. Little housekeeping. There should be in your menu a question box, just like here's a picture of it. But uh, that's where you would type in your question and you hit submit and uh, we'll be tracking that as we go. That's me with dark hair. Every time you see me, it's a different color. Um, I've been with um, ARC Benefits for about almost eight years. It'll be eight years in September. And um, I need to update this because it's more like 25 years of experience in health, insur health insurance. I started my career working with large group self-funded so uh, if you're not sure what that means, it just means that those companies acted like their own insurance companies, purchased, you know, what we call stop loss insurance and managed their claims a little differently. And um, and that's that's really made its way down into the smaller group market. You'll see a lot of things like level funded health plans and those provide a lot more protection, but it's a great background. It really helps us understand um, what we can and can't do. Um, but uh, I've really enjoyed my time here at ARC. And uh, anyways, I lead the team here for the client advisors. So that means I get to learn about compliance a lot more than I want to know. The reason why we go, oh, another way to stay in the know is to sign up for our monthly newsletter. If you're not getting that, there is some, I have a compliance corner in there that we started a couple months ago. And um, there are blog posts that are also on our website. So if you're looking for a specific topic, you can usually find it. Um, old articles will become blogs, if that makes sense. And um, you can contact this email news at ARC Benefit Solutions, or you can contact your client advisor and they'll get you signed up. Our next webinar, I'm just gonna do a plug for that one, will be about workers' compensation in Ohio. There are several large group pools. So if you're familiar with the multiple employer plans that the chambers are offering on the medical side. This is something similar on the workers comp side. And there is a, a, a firm that's going to come in and do a, a seminar. Last month we did one on a chamber um, pooled employer plan that was a 401k. So kind of like in that theme, creating ways for smaller employers to easily offer um, you know, better benefits at a lower price. So that's on August 18th. We'd love to see you there. Now, <laughs> the first rule of Compliance Club is you don't talk about Compliance Club. And the reason is people might be driving and they might fall asleep. So that's why you don't talk about it. <laughs> okay, I, I'm just imagining that you're laughing at my little joke. But um, the other rules that we have to follow um, when I talk to groups, I, I generally say we've got three sets of rules that we have to comply with. Some are federal, some are state, and some are carrier specific. And, you know, the federal rules are overseen by the Department of Labor, the IRS, and HHS or CMS. And these are all different acts that have been passed. Um, and it seems like things get passed fairly frequently, at least once a year. And if they're not changing, then we have a, a change in administration in the White House, and uh, they may change how we ad administer a certain set of laws. So we have to keep on top of that. Um, at the state level, most of them try to keep up with federal rules to make it easier to do business across state lines. But there are a couple of states, if you're hiring employees outside of your, your core state, you just have to know that there are some laws that impact employers, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, why should you care? Well, part of it is that the penalties for noncompliance are usually 
per day per occurrence, and they can get sizable. Um, some laws are designed to give the benefit of the doubt to the employee, regardless of whether or not you did everything exactly right. COBRA is one example of that. Um, if a COBRA, if an employee disputes something in COBRA, you have to have pretty good documentation to show that you did everything you were supposed to do, um, or they will find in favor of the member. And just as a FYI, you may have recognized this, but I see it all the time, but most legis legislation that gets passed regarding group health coverage is listed as the employer's responsibility. And part of that is because I think the government doesn't want to have ownership of monitoring it, um, but by making you responsible for it, then hopefully your vendors will comply. And that's normally what happens. The insurance market will comply and create tools and resources and incorporate those. But but if anybody hasn't told you, there's a cost associated with that. And, and uh, so a portion of those increases that you get is sometimes regulatory environment changes that they have to, to do to comply with what, what law has come down. So how ARC supports your business, we try to make it easier for you to be compliant by giving you ready-made tools that you can give your employees. We use a lot of boilerplate language as much as possible. We have reminders, toolkits, and guidance. We'll talk about some of those examples. If those tools don't work, we also have some partners and vendors who can provide more customized solutions if you need it. For example, if you want a custom um, summary plan description, you know, we've got several vendors that we can go to or recommend for you to help you with that. And then also we review things at renewal, any changes based on your group size. So we're going to ask you questions like, how many total employees do you have? Are, are you an applicable large employer? And if you don't know what that means, um, we'll talk about that too. Because you need to know at, at, at some point, that's a good measurement you know, uh, a good measurement of whether or not you need to comply with some new rules is your renewal, because that's when the government, if you've changed in size, they expect you to adjust that at your medical renewal. So, anywho, some of the resources that we use, we've got government resources. We purchased the Zywave as a, as a vendor, and it's an attorney vetted site. Um, we purchased their content cloud. We've also purchased HR 360, and we make that available to clients upon request. However, HR 360 was purchased by Zywave and it's being sunsetted. So we're in the process of implementing a new customer portal through Zywave that's similar to our content cloud and we'll make that available to all of our customers. You'll be seeing an email pushed out probably in the next month or so. We're doing the implementation of that as we speak. I just uh, sat through a call yesterday but what's great about HR 360 is it's not just a compliance tool. It also has some HR tools to help you um, build employee booklets for you know, your policies and procedures. It has benchmarking for salaries and income and based on industry and size of group and things like that. So it's a really great tool. When you get that invitation, you should really go out and check that out. If you don't have a leave policy or you don't have um, an employment booklet, you can actually download a template and start working with it just that quick. So it's a great tool. Um, the other thing that we do is we are members of the Employee Benefits Institute of America. It's basically a database of court cases, laws and regulations and opinions on those laws and regs and how to apply them. Because even though the regs say one thing, the application might be very different because of the comment periods that happen after laws are passed. And um, you might find that the regs are a little more lenient than what the laws would suggest. So um, we, uh, per it's, a, it's basically a subscription that we purchase. And, uh, you know, I, I get emails from them on at least a, a weekly basis that kind of highlight some things that we need to look at. We're also members, uh, several of us are members of different national associations. One is SHRM, which is the Society of Human Resources Manager Managers, and also NAHU, which is changing its name, but it's it's basically a lobbying slash trade association. And I just got back from their annual convention about um, two or three weeks ago. And uh, that's one way that we stay on top of any of these regs that are changing 
periodically because the regs will like i said they'll say one thing but then you get into how do i apply this to real life um, we rely a lot on the carriers and their legal interpretations it's very interesting they all have these armies of attorneys and when laws get passed they all come out with how they're going to administer it and then they look at each other and they go oh i like how so and so did theirs so they change it to how and eventually it settles down into one way so that's just kind of a funny thing we have an ERISA attorney on retainer he's really there for us less and, and we can ask him basic questions and if you get into something where he needs to get into your your biz wax is how I'd say it if he really needs to dig in on your specific um, issue and 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 give you a legal opinion then he'll quote your price for that he also will refer us to labor specialists sometime there's only two in the state of ohio believe it or not um but uh if you get into a pickle with an employee he'll he'll quickly say you know what this is outside of my area but this is probably something a labor specialist should help with i have a recommendation and and the employer can choose whether or not they want to get engaged at that point but that's happened a couple of times in the past couple of years and then, of course, we have a, a back office support team with Cornerstone Broker Insurance Services. So those are all the different resources we use to stay on top of everything. We help you with the guardrails. Um, first off is discrimination rules. Uh, some, mostly that applies to medical, but it can apply to some other benefits, group benefits, dental vision, that sort of thing. We'll share with you what your waiting period options are when coverage must be offered and to whom, when or if you need to comply with state continuation or COBRA, depending on what state you're in. Um, in our core markets, there are two states that don't have state continuation and two that do. So I think it's Indiana and, and, and Michigan don't have state continuation and Kentucky and Ohio do. When, uh, the other, oops, I went ahead. I went, didn't mean to do that, sorry. The other thing we'd like to talk about is if you're an IRS control group, if you own multiple companies and those companies have multiple employees, you could potentially be a 50 plus group and it changes your requirements um, in terms of how much you charge employees and what notice requirements you have and uh, some other IRS obligations. So we like to keep tabs on that. When you start to get close, it's a good time for us to sit down and talk about this stuff because it applies to 50 plus rules, like I said, and also moving down. So if your company, you sell off a division or something like that, um, that could also change your compliance. So we need to kind of talk through that when it happens. And last but not least, whether or not the, the cost of coverage and how you charge employees, um, can you charge one set of employees a different rate than another? We like to talk about those kinds of things if you're gonna do that because we have had to advise customers uh, when ACA was passed that they weren't, uh, they couldn't charge one set of rates for one set of employees who happen to be owners, you know, charge them less than what you're charging the rest of the employees. So that's one example. Feel free to jump in with any questions if you have them. We also prepare compliance documents and we're in the process of doing that. We do that in the off season. For example, right now is, is what we would consider off season, even though we're still working on renewals, they're not as many. And so what you'll start to see from us over the next year, because it takes time to get that this, this process done, is we've invested in a tool that allows us to prepare these documents um, once we get all of the client data in there. And for medical clients with two or more covered employees, we prepare the following. One is the POP or premium conversion plan. That's for your pre-tax health benefits. It has to be restated every five years unless you have a vendor, a vendor change or a language change that's required by law. And basically you're just agreeing to certain rules when you take pre-tax contributions, that's all. Annual notices, there are seven standard and several other contingent notices that are required for employers. There's actually 63 different notices, but a lot of them are taken care of by your insurance company. Um, there is a, de a Department of Labor compliance guide, and I think I can pop that up. I'm probably gonna talk about this again, but this is 154 pages of the most exciting 
information. Um, and it goes through all of the notices, what, you know, if you're really worried about whether you're being compliant or not, this is a, is a free document available on the Department of Labor website. I just downloaded this one back in February. Be happy to share this with you if you're interested in it. But um, there are easier ways to get at that data, <laughs> believe me. Um, so one is, you know, we've already done that legwork and decided these are the these are the ones that you want to get out to employees annually, because some of them are contingent. Like if a COBRA event happens, you send this notice. Well, these annual notices have to go out to your employees each year. We believe that best practice is sending them electronically with an offer to print if needed. If your employee population doesn't have a way of getting things electronically, um, then just let us know. We'll talk about other options for getting that in their hands. We also recommend that you include it with open enrollment information, including the Part D notice. Now, a lot of employers say, well, not I don't have anybody who's close to age 65 who would need a Part D notice. But you can't always assume that um, either a spouse or somebody in their family might not need that notice. And it's just easier to just get the same notices out to everyone all at once rather than scrambling around and trying to get that out to who needs it once a year. So that's kind of where we're headed with that. You might see this year it might still get it piecemeal from your client advisor, but um, eventually we'll have it so that everybody has it as part of their annual notices. Lastly, there's a wrap summary plan description. SPD, because we like an acronyms in our business, if it's not provided by your carrier or administrator. Just like the POP, it has to be restated every five years unless there are vendor changes or regulatory changes. And this wrap includes details the carrier policies don't include, such as your specific eligibility rules or contact information if somebody has a dispute. Um, or a legal notice that they need to send. Um, that's what the purpose of the wrap. Now, these are things that if, if the Department of Labor were to audit you, you're required to have these on hand if you are offering group health coverage. A lot of employers don't really even know that. So this is one of the ways that we're just, again, trying to help our customers because most of them are, you know, you've just started out, you're just trying to run your business. And you don't even know that the government's placed all these requirements on you. So if you're offering group medical coverage, we want to make it easy so that all you're doing is, um, you know, we're keeping you compliant, but also keeping you on top of what would be needed if that were to happen. Again, we also do reminders in our, in our newsletter. A couple of things that we did as, as examples. Um, every year we do an ACA reporting guide. It shows you links. It shows you how each major carrier is assisting with data. It shows you what you need to do. And then, of course, you have your client advisor who can also help. We also help with the Medicare Part D notice. We remind you that that's supposed to go out to employees October 15th. But like I said, we're moving towards including that in your open enrollment materials. So if you've passed that out in January, you've already taken care of that um, October 15th deadline. The other deadline is notifying CMS online on their form of whether or not your Part D, uh, of whether your plan is creditable for Part D. I cannot talk. Creditable for Part D. Hopefully that was clear. <laughs> Lastly, PCORI fee. Uh, PCORI fees are, um, it's actually patient-centered um, organizational research, I don't know. I, okay, I should have looked that up before I walked in here. But basically, under ACA, <laughs> it's a it's a fee that they are sending to an organization that decides on um, what kind of researches need to be done for um, patient-centered um, medical organizations and how can we improve our healthcare system. And so they they fund research studies. And uh, this was supposed to sunset last year, but it was it was continued. So it's a very nominal fee. But if you have a self-funded, level-funded um, plan or an HRA, a health reimbursement arrangement, you're obligated to pay this. And it's per belly button, 
not per employee. So each member, it's less than three dollars, and it's a you know per head once a year. Um, if you have both, if you have a self-funded plan and an HRA, you only owe one fee. Okay, next slide. Cobra or state continuation. Um, state continuation in Ohio only applies if somebody is terminated um, or laid off, not if they choose to leave on their own. Um, COBRA has some different rules. If you're subject to COBRA, it's 20 or more employees and they do count your part-timers and they, there's a calculation that you have to do if you've got part-timers who aren't even on your plan to determine whether or not you have to comply with COBRA. So again, we review those headcounts at Renewal with you to determine whether or not you need to have COBRA. We no longer perform COBRA in admin in-house. We used to. We have a handful of trusted advisors we've done business with and we've negotiated pricing for our customers. Or you can use your insurance carrier's COBRA service. The challenge with that is if you have ancillary lines with another carrier, they don't usually mix. So you could potentially have two COBRA administrators or they may not administer your dental and vision if your dental and vision is somewhere else. So it's best to just outsource it to a COBRA vendor. If you want to outsource state continuation, we have a vendor named BOI. They're the only ones that I know of that will do this kind of administration. Due to timing and terminations and notices, we do require clients be responsible for notifying the COBRA administrator of any terms for employees, spouses, or dependents. Now, usually folks will send us their terminations or their additions, um, and then we get those processed on the carrier site. But you should be responsible for notifying the COBRA administrator because you have 14 days from the, from the, the date of termination to get a notice into the member's hands if they're qualified for one. And also, did you know there's an, init an initial notice when people gain coverage? So when they join your plan, there's an initial notice they're supposed to get. If you have a good COBRA administrator, uh, they also need to be notified of any new hires so they can get that notice out to those employees. So again, we recommend vendors so they can administer COBRA. And um, a lot of them have very good systems for tracking what they're doing, when they sent it, um, and um, that way it limits your risk if you do happen to get sued by somebody who says, hey, they didn't offer me COBRA and they should have, or I never got my notice, um, that COBRA vendor can protect you because they're tracking all of that information. The other thing that I have over here on the right-hand side is you don't have to offer COBRA to an employee if they're being fired for doing something illegal. And a lot of folks, uh, you know, I've gone through this with a couple of clients. We talked to the, the our, our attorney and, you know, we just posed back to the client that the reason why you may want to leave them on your plan or allow them to elect COBRA or go ahead and offer it is that if they're not ultimately convicted of that crime, you might, you might have some issues if you didn't offer them COBRA. So it's usually a, a contentious termination anyways. So a lot of employers will just go ahead and offer them the coverage. Okay, I hope everybody's still awake. So some new things that have come down the pike and you're starting to see, you're starting to see these things now, even though this was passed about two years ago by the Trump administration, uh, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, this was a bipartisan bill it required transparency related to the cost and quality of care for insurers, plan sponsors, employers, pharmacy benefit managers, hospitals, other health providers, and brokers. So you'll start to see from us a disclosure for any renewal after 1227. If we expect to, to make more than $1,000 in a calendar year, we're going to disclose what we're making on medical, dental, and vision and you'll start seeing that with your renewals. Another requirement is that um, all the insurers and employers who sponsor health plans had to provide machine readable files 
of all provider contractor rates by 7-1 on a publicly available site. There was a newsletter article on this last month where I said, most of the carriers that we work with will have their site searchable by either the name of the, the employer or their tax ID. Now, there, there are some interpretations of this rule that says the employer needs to have something on their site pointing to that link uh, for the carrier. Uh, I think that is, um, I think that's a little bit of overkill right now, especially since um, the only people that would be looking for that would be your own employees, and they'll see that on the carrier site, or your employees' providers. Um, the machine-readable files are not necessarily easy to use um, at this point. We expect that the reason why they're making them available is so that the market can then respond with tools to allow you to shop for the cost of care um, across multiple vendors. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. I actually think that's something that our industry has needed for a long time. Um, what's also going to be required is that carriers will have to make sure that their, their online directories and their print directories are, are absolutely correct. And that was delayed until early 2023, but you know, it's really not fair to an employee if they go online and they see Dr. Smith is in network. And by the time they get in to see Dr. Smith, he's no longer in network. And I think this is actually a really good thing. It's, it's much more fair to members. It's really frustrating. I've worked for a network in the past and you'd be amazed how many times um, a doctor might have a buddy who comes in and works for one day at his firm and uh, bills under a totally different tax ID number and uh, he's not considered a network even though he's contracted at 10 other places that he works. That can be really frustrating for a member. It causes huge issues on the claim side. Hospitals now also have to publish their fee schedules online. This is huge. There are, the, the American Hospital Association is fighting this. They do not want to do that. But if you go to a couple of site uh, hospital websites, you can start to see some of the most common procedures. You will see fee schedules by carrier, as well as the cash price and how much Medicare pays. This will be a huge eye opener. I just did an article for the next newsletter on this very topic because I do think this is going to have an impact if members get engaged um, somehow through plan design or incentives to start looking this information up. So really exciting. Um, carriers and plan sponsors must provide average cost data for the top 500 procedures for member support. You won't start to see that until um, early next year. And then pharmacy benefit managers who do your prescription drugs, they will have the same kind of reporting um, that they're going to have to post as well as uh, providing reporting to the Department of Labor, the IRS, and HHS. And I think it's at the core of trying to figure out where are rebates going, are there kickbacks, who's getting those kickbacks. Uh, I think it's, it's going to help the market in the long run. Lastly, if you are self-funded or level funded as plan sponsor, these are your requirements that have to that have been outsourced. So any vendors that you hire need to comply. And I will say if you're not working with like a core carrier like a United or an Anthem or an Aetna who have level funded plans, um, if you're working with somebody who who uh, like a Trustmark or an Allstate, those or, or any other TPA, they may not have it readily available on day one. They might need some push. You might have to ask if they're going to do it. I mean, we we will ask them as well as we as we meet with them. But uh, just know that you know when you're in those types of plans, ultimately the responsibility is considered yours because you're sponsoring the plan. So you want to make sure you have a good partner who's doing that. Another thing that's new and I think this is really good for members because this has happened for a lot of us we've seen a lot of claim issues with this was the no surprises act and there was a federal version and a state version and the federal version basically said 
certain out-of-network claims require a proactive negotiation of cost with no balance billing of patients. Um, there was a court case in Colorado where a lady went into what she thought was an in-network hospital for back surgery. They told her she would only owe roughly $1,400. After the surgery, she received a bill for $200,000 plus because by the time she had the services, they were out of network. And uh, they went through several appeals. Finally, the state Supreme Court ruled in her favor, basically said that this was an egregious bill based on the fact that, you know, they paid, well, they said that the payment that United Healthcare, who was this lady's carrier, um, had made was reasonable and customary. And they determined that um, based on how much they pay other vendors for the same, or other carriers rather, what they pay that hospital for the same procedure. They indicated that if uh, under state, I'm sorry, under US code, you if you can't determine the price up front, then that bill is subject to what we call open price terms, which means that you can't bill some crazy amount. You have to bill something that's reasonable and that buyer can expect a reasonable charge. You can't price gouge people in other words. But in this case, um, if you go to care in an in-network hospital and you get care at that hospital by a non-network physician, this happens all the time. So because hospitals have a hard time staffing physicians, they'll contract with an agency that has lots of emergency room physicians, but that firm will not participate in the network. <laughs> so the member gets stuck with a bill for an out-of-network claim when in fact they went to an in-network hospital and that's not really fair to them. And for a period of time, the insurance carriers were paying those claims out of network and requiring that the member appeal in order to get their claim paid, which is kind of, uh, in my opinion, ridiculous. Um, they knew that they should pay it, but I think they were hoping that they wouldn't have to. But this happened across emergency rooms, pathologists, radiologists, anesthesia. Those are the most common. But it can happen with other types of claims. Uh, another example would be um, air ambulance. So if somebody needs to be life flighted somewhere, uh, I know of a, a gentleman who, he was nine miles from the nearest hospital. They life flighted him and he got a $19,000 bill. And that was after his health plan paid $50,000. So he was not real happy about that. And if you wonder about the cost of care, that's an example. And because air ambulances are managed by the federal government, the states couldn't fix it. So the federal law actually fixed that situation. They have to bill a reasonable fee. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of hope that we're heading in the right direction with these two laws. Lastly, but not least, for groups, large groups that are 50 or more, we help those groups determine if they're an applicable large employer. And whenever the government passes the law, they like to make sure that they change the rules for how you count and determine whether or not you're, uh, whether you're not subject to that law. So you can't count that it's the same way that you count for COBRA. It's a totally different way of counting. But we have tools to help you figure that stuff out. Um, <laughs> we also will review ACA affordability of premiums because once you become an applicable large employer, your premiums have to be considered uh, affordable. And in general, I'd say if you have employees that are making $11 or less, they're usually eligible for Medicaid. And so they're not going to go get a subsidy. If you don't offer coverage and you don't offer affordable coverage, then you could be subject to penalties under the Affordable Care Act. So we try and minimize those as much as possible. We'll also help you uh, determine what measurement periods that you can use for employees so you can delay offering coverage. If you have variable hour employees or temp employees, a lot of restaurants sometimes will have lots of part-timers. Those folks add together to form a single employer or employee rather. And so sometimes your head counts can get pretty big, pretty fast. But as long as you're tracking who you're offering coverage for and um, 
and if you have variable hours then you might not have to offer them coverage for a period of time if they meet the criteria um, so those are some things we talk about with employers we also recommend that you retain offers of coverage for each open enrollment period with signatures for each employee so that you know that you've offered them coverage so if you do happen to go um, to become an applicable large employer you need to track what's been offered and when it was offered because it could help you with the very next bullet which is assistance with 22j penalty letters i've only had one client come back with a penalty letter and they were roughly 120 lives employee lives rather they had really good data but the the finance person sent it to me and said oh my god i got a sixty-five thousand dollar bill please tell me i don't owe this we did the math they did have somebody who got a subsidy um, the, uh, the coverage was not affordable to that person. They ended up with a $15,000 penalty, which was still cheaper than um, if they offered coverage to everybody as um, a large employer would be required to do. So they were happy just paying that. Um, you may not be, but, but th that works for their business. So, um, you know, we meet people where they are. The other thing we can do when you hit that 50 mark is evaluating family medical leave. That's another rule. I don't know if I put that in the alphabet soup at the beginning, but once you hit that 50 mark, if you have 50 in a 150 mile radius, you would be eligible uh, for, or you'd be required to comply with family medical leave rules. And there are lots of vendors that can help you administer that as well. Then of course, if you go over 100, we help you pull the data to complete your 5500, which is an IRS tax filing. And I think that's it. Oh, what's next? What's coming next? Um, we're starting to see some pharmacy benefit pricing controls. Um, that, yeah, that's really under, under the gun. I don't think it got passed yet, but it's right now as we speak being talked about. There's some in, insulin cost programs similar to what Colorado did. Colorado just said you have to cover it at 100%, um, which is a, a great win for type 1 diabetics and, and other diabetics. Um, it's already somewhat low cost. It's when you get into um, boutiques, when you can't take the generic, it gets a little more expensive. But most of the carriers, even in Ohio, will include diabetic supplies um, free of cost for diabetics and then of course we've got election 2022 so when that happens we expect to see maybe some more changes legislatively depending on whether we get more red more blue or a little bit of purple so with that if you've got any questions i'll look in the in the box i don't currently see any questions if we didn't cover something that you expected us to that you'd like us to I'm more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, with your client advisor, or um, you know, if you're looking for some more information, I think that Zywave Content Cloud is going to be really beneficial to you. But we'll we're we're happy to be your guide, whatever way you need us. Hope to see you next week. Have a great day. I'm just going to stay here a little bit longer, see if there's any questions. Okay, with that, I'm going to close it out. Everyone have a great day. Take care.